Good evening and welcome to the program Dialogue on Liberty Television. My name is Anthony Momodi. Welcome to today's broadcast. As usual, go out of our way to get the finest minds in the continent so that you're well educated and uh, enlightened as regards uh, the very salient issues plaguing Africa's biggest black nation, Nigeria. On today's edition, we'll be swaying a little bit away from politics and other issues. We'll be going into the uh, judiciary, where we're looking at Nigeria's judicial challenges and the consequences is what we'll be looking at today. And uh, on today's edition, we've got one of Nigeria's finest uh, in the judicial sector. We've got a uh, proud Uzodima as our guest on today's edition to help us look at uh, the rot in the judiciary, especially when you cast your mind back. Uh, two years back, we had the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, National Bureau of Statistics, uh, come out to say that uh, the judiciary and the police are the two most corrupt agencies in the country. Uh, let's make welcome, Prada. Nice to have you Thank in the you studio. For having me. Mm, thank you for having me. All right, uh, let's uh, look at uh, the issue of the judiciary. Uh, but first of all, I'd just like to give us an idea. What is the judiciary supposed to be doing? What is their constitutional mandate? Okay, I think when we talk about judiciary, that is an arm of government. As okay. we all know, we have three arms of government, yeah. the executive, the judiciary, and legislative. Right. Now, the judiciary's main function, or their roles, is to interpret and apply the laws. Right? I think that is what the judiciary is known for. That is the power that the Constitution gives to the judiciary, to interpret and apply the laws. laws. Okay. Well, tell us again, we know that uh, before when you're caught to bar, there's uh, this part of the deal where you take an oath, just like the doctors do. Uh, what does the oath really say? Because most times it's behind closed doors, so mm -hmm. we're not quite sure if the oath is really st stringent enough, because if you look at how the sad news coming out from the sector, uh, what does the oath say? What does it mandate you to do? Okay, I don't think it mandates you. I think it's more of an ethical issue. Okay. Um, so the oath is just asking lawyers to do what is called like the best practice. Okay. So to serve your clients with the best of your ability, to do that judicially, to do that faithfully and in the best interest. Also keeping in mind that the aim of the legal practice is to defend and stand up for people that cannot do that for themselves or require your assistance. So I think in terms of the oath, it's all about doing what you can with, in the best interest of your clients, doing it judiciously and doing that faithfully. All right. Uh, in, in terms of uh, other doing things faithfully, is it right to say uh, the judiciary, the autonomy sought by the judiciary, how important is it for you to achieve the few things you just said? Um, I think with regards to the autonomy of the judiciary, I think it is very essential. Because although we have three arms of government, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislative, those three arms can only function if they are independent. Okay, true. And I think that is why the judiciary is seeking for this independence. Because if we are independent, it means that we have no ties to any other arm. It means that we can function on our own by ourselves. Is it, is it more of uh, the, the independency or the fact that... Uh, the financing part of it, the fact that they want autonomy so that they can finance themselves, they can get monies to themselves without going through the federal government or trying to please someone. How does that affect, uh, affect uh, the rulings we've seen over time? Okay, I think the two are correlated, okay. right? They're very correctable. So in the sense that if the judiciary does not have this financial autonomy, how can we really say that they are independent? You know, for example, I'll say in the layman terms, if I was paying, for example, your salary, there's only a limit of things that you'd be able to tell me. There's only a limit that you'd be able to criticize me in or with regards. So when the judiciary asks for financial autonomy, I think it is very important because it, it guarantees our the judiciary's independence in a form or in a manner. So I'm saying to you that I want to be able to make my own financial decisions. Right now, what we have is the executive controlling the finances of the judiciary. So which means, or indirectly implies, that the judiciary is subject to the executive because we, we've seen cases where the executive or a member of the government, per se, is um, giving a court order and they are reluctant to obey that court order. You know, we've seen cases like that because of, and why is that, and why do they get away with these things? And that is because of the executive finances the judiciary. So there's only, so the judiciary hands are tied, the judiciary's hands are tied if they cannot do so much against the executive because they are expecting that finance from the executive. Mm -hmm. So that is why we are seeking for this financial autonomy, this financial independence. If we really, as a judiciary, is going to be independent, then we require that financial autonomy. 
Alright, uh, uh, let's look at corruption. Okay. Uh, the National Bureau of Statistics says you and those in your sector are the most corrupt. Do you agree with them? Sincerely. Um, I don't think there is any country or any person that is not being affected by corruption. I understand that in Nigeria there's something that we have to always deliberate about, the level of corruption. Um, I would not sit down here and say that the judiciary is absorbent of corruption. Okay. There can be, as we know, some cor corrupt legal um, practitioners, some corrupt judges, but it is hard to make statements without evidence backing them. You know, how many judges have we seen, although people allege corruption, how many judges have we actually seen that have been tried and declared corrupt? You know, so sitting down here as a legal pr practitioner, although I'm aware of corruption being something that is tainted, or something that the judiciary is being tainted for, there is hardly any evidence backing the allegiance of corruption. But is it, do you think it's going to be easy getting evidence when those, the two set of people who are supposed to find them guilty have, have already been found guilty? Uh, <laughs> do you expect the police to say uh, the judiciary is corrupt and the judiciary to say the police is corrupt? Because both of them work hand in hand. But uh, let's go further. Uh, looking at the recent, uh, some years back, there was a read on judges at uh, their homes and all that. Uh, okay. Some uh, foreign currencies were allegedly found and all that. Is that not enough reason, enough evidence to back up? Uh, because you asked that there were no obvious evidence. Is that not enough? Okay, are you saying that because some judges were found with some foreign currencies that they are corrupt? They are human beings, just like us. I'm pretty sure if I search your bag right now, I'll see some currencies, whether they are foreign or not. You know, so I'm a lawyer and I, it's, it's not about saying something, but it's about proving it. Okay. You know, in the, in, the, in, in the course of law, what you cannot prove, it should not be said. You know, there must be evidence backing anything you say. So if I want to allege you're a corrupt person, I should okay. be able to bring up some kind of evidence saying that you are corrupt. And if I cannot do that, then it's hard for me to now say that you are corrupt without the evidence. So although lots of people come out to say our judges are corrupt, the judicial system is tainted with corruption, how many times have we seen lawyers or legal practitioners being alleged or tried and you know but found corrupt. Is it going to be easy when the same people who are supposed to try and uh, uh, prosecute them are uh, in the same sector? Just like uh, getting a policeman to arrest another policeman. Uh, recently, we heard from the committee that was set up uh, to probe or uh, the panel that Abba Kari was supposed to face or faced came out with a report, and the IGP did uh, reject the first report, saying they were too lenient on Abba Kari. So. That's just to show you what I was trying to drive out when I say. Okay, but let's look at the issue of multiple or uh, conflicting court rulings. So doesn't that also suggest what we're trying to say here? I think Why are there all these multiple court rulings? I think that is one of the I think, challenges that we face as a judicial system. And I can only tie that to the amount of influence that the executive has on the judiciary. You know, and that is why we are seeking for autonomy. I think once, once people hear autonomy, the only thing they think about is financial autonomy. Okay. But for us to actually be separate from the executive, to be able to operate as a judiciary or as a, as a judicial body, we need to be able to have, for example, court bodies. So let me give you an example in layman terms now. Okay. If I've got a court order as a lawyer asking the police to arrest, for example, a notable politician, it is going to be very hard because the police is under indirectly the influence of the executive or the government. Okay. You know, so we see cases like this and we, f we hear cases and situations like this where the court has issued a court order, but it is very difficult in practice for the people that are supposed to um, impact those laws All to right. go and carry them out. That is because they will be done at using one or two bodies, the police, the DSS, or perhaps the SSS, which are under the control of the executive. Okay. So what I think can be a, a, or an advantage or something that we can learn from that is perhaps the court should consider having its own enforcement bodies, oh. you know, then maybe court police or something that are independent from the executive. Okay. I feel like this makes it more realistic or more practical to carry out these court orders. Obviously, I'm not, um, I'm aware of a situation where a court order is being flouted. Okay. We have options given to us by the constitution that allows us to hold the content not, you know, okay. eligible, yeah, in contempt of court order, but okay. it's not about so having the laws, it's why, about the practice. Okay, why, okay because I, recently in South Africa, we saw that uh, Jacob Zuma mm. was actually put behind bars for contempt of court yes. order. Uh, why can't we achieve that in Nigeria, and why can't the legal body uh, 
force the president to do the needful, what the constitution says? I don't think it's just something that we cannot achieve. I think when it comes to influential members of okay. the government, right. right, there seems to be some kind of reluctance for those um, police officers okay. to actually carry out the job. Because we must also live in the reality of the situation, right? Okay. The, so executive, the, finance, the okay. Ex executive finances those institutions. Sure. And that is why the judiciary is seeking for this autonomy. The moment we do not have them financing us, the moment we are able to carry out our finances by ourselves, then we can make some certain decisions that might be against the executive, but we are able to do those anyway. The reason why we cannot do that right now is because we are not autonomous. We are, therefore, and if we are not autonomous, it means we are not independent. I think that is why we are pushing for the um, autonomy of the judiciary. That is why we had the strike, the Jusen strike that was, you know, trending um, two months ago, about three months ago. That is what essentially we are asking for. We are asking to be able to maintain and finance ourselves. Okay, uh, let's uh, go back uh, to this multiple court rulings. Uh, my question is, uh, when a court ruling, uh, recently we had the PDP scandal playing out, uh, where uh, Uche Secundus had to go to one of the northern states to get a ruling, uh, giving him the right to remain and get other rulings from other states. Is it that uh, the rulings or, or the judges, they are not coordinated? They don't, uh, they're not aware of other rulings of other courts. Is, is that why they go ahead to make rulings that seem to supersede uh, previous rulings? Why is that? Okay, so is that in the same court, the same level of courts in the high courts? Yeah. I'm well, I'm not familiar with the um, facts of that case, yes, but okay. what I know is um, if you have a grievance, you're allowed to right. appeal your matter to a higher court. court okay. You know, I think it is um, not proper or it's not legal that um, we have different courts on the same level giving different okay. rulings. I think okay. that just shows the amount of abuse, you know, and challenge that we face as a judiciary by the executive, you know. And the funny thing about it is that when, uh, when most of these cases come with the multiple court rulings, they're mostly political cases. Okay. Right? So I think it's just showing the influence that the executive has on the judiciary. Hence why we keep on reiterating the need for that independence, the need for that financial autonomy. You know, if the executive can, to an extent, indirectly control the judiciary, then we have no independence, we have no autonomy. So that is, I think that is what we now, as a judiciary, is trying to push for, that independence, to limit the amount of um, multiple court rulings that we have. All right, uh, most times uh, they, they say the political instability in Nigeria over the years and also the incursion of the military uh, has cost Nigeria a lot of uh, troubles in becoming a very uh, a democratic a country in true sense of it, in terms of uh, the leadership not obeying court orders. Uh, the, the fact that the president uh, several times refused to obey the court order of uh, the former NSA, Sabu Dasiki and others, uh, what can be done to, can it be done in retrospect? In retrospect, yes. can what be done in retrospect? The, the fact that he, he disobeyed the court order, can he be punished in retrospect? Is it possible? Is it is it something that not doable? I don't think. I think when we look at that case, I don't think it is the president that is supposed to be enforcing that particular order. Or I, think the it is, of, uh, I think it's having an executive body that okay. was giving the mandate to probably enforce that order, okay. not the president directly. His job is not to come down from you know yeah. what he's doing to enforce the order. Like having perhaps maybe a police officer, perhaps maybe the chairman of the DSS or something that was supposed to carry out that enforcement of that order. So I don't think it's something that we have to um, you know blame the president for or drag him. It's more about looking at the person that was actually supposed to enforce the order, who was the security um, detail or who was the security um, personnel that was assigned to enforce that order. And if you look at it, at the end of the day, it's probably going to be an institution that is being financed by the executive. And these are the difficulties that we're talking about. These are the challenges that we're facing as a judiciary. The fact that we do not have that independence, that complete independence from the executive. Well, uh, let's look at uh, FIDA, FIDA, uh, Federation of uh, International Women Lawyers. Lawyers. Okay. Uh, can you say FIDA is actually playing the role it's supposed to play, and um, is it achieving its uh, mandate? Yes, 100%. Um, um, I'm a member of the body, FIDA okay. itself, so I have seen the amount of um, impact that they have had with regards to the outreaches, with regards to the training, the development, you know, reaching out to communities. And it's not just a situation of giving back or sharing a bunch of materials. It's about educating the members of the community towards their rights, you know, towards um, assisting those that cannot also afford to, you know, take up their matter in courts, assisting them legally. 
So I think FIDA 100% is doing what they can. Are they focused on, on the, uh, the women and girls are strictly, yes. are they more of a uh, activist for the women folks? Uh, is, is that the, the straight line agenda of uh, FIDA? Yeah, I think um, the the mandate of FIDA is for women and children. Okay. That does not mean that if you're a man in need, we'll just chuck you out the way. But no, okay. our main focus is to help the women and the children. And why is that? Because we feel like they are the most vulnerable in society, you know. So we feel like the issues that are faced by women and children cannot be compared to that that are faced by men. Although we're not ignorant of the fact that men do face some certain issues, but okay. we feel like women and children are more vulnerable towards these issues. And that is why we, as a body, are more inclined towards women and children. Okay, in, in terms of uh, pro bono uh, services, um, I know that uh, for once in come a senior advocate of Nigeria, you have to do some level of ad, uh, pro bono cases. Yeah. Uh, let's look at the issue of pro bono. Uh, Yes, some persons uh, do it for the sake of the fact yes, they want to achieve the SAN. But should that be the main purpose of pro bono cases? Um, no, um, and I don't think that is. I think it's, it's, it's required that you have a pro bono case, but I don't think that is the main factor that, okay. will, that will get you an SAN, that will get you to become a senior advocate of Nigeria. All right. I mean, there are other qualifications, there are other things that you need, such as having a certain amount of federal high court cases, you know, there's also an interview towards your personality to see how you've handled those cases. You know, there's also going to be a background search to see if you've been caught in any compromising position. Okay. You know, and they look at um, the recommendation from the judges, from the senior um, judicial um, bodies as well. So it's not just about having pro bono cases. The pro bono cases will help because okay. it is a it's the form of you giving back to the community. But that is not the major consideration when. Um, the, the privilege committee is looking at making you a senior advocate. It's more about how you've carried yourself over the 10 years or more, how you've conducted yourself, how you've conducted your legal cases, you know, and okay. in general, you just how have you been as a legal practitioner? Not, more, not, not about the pro bono cases that you have. Okay, uh, for you personally, how many pro bono cases have you um, I don't really think I can keep count of the amount of pro bono cases that I have done. But the one that comes close to my mind would be the magistrate court case that I was able to achieve for my clients. Um, she was having some issues with, um, it was a family issue, so right. we were able to resolve that in her favor. So I think that is the most recent problem. Would that if whether she was right or wrong? Um, I don't think um, it's about being right or wrong. When I look at um, handling pro bono cases, I, okay. I try to put myself in the place of the victim, right? You know, and, and the only the only thing that makes me um, want to take up those cases is the fact that they have been wronged and they cannot afford the legal services to correct that wrong and that is what I look at when I'm considering taking up a case pro bono, not okay. if the person is right or wrong. I think most of those matters or most of these cases are more complicated than being right or, or wrong. What you find with most legal cases is that it is neither black or white, it's always a mix. Okay. So it's about maybe a miscommunication or something that could be easily handled out of court but for some reasons it's been exaggerated. So what I look at when I'm looking for pro bono cases is has a wrong been committed? Can my client afford to take up this case or can they not? How can I help them? So I think that is my major focus when looking at these cases. Okay, just a little bit more about the pro bono cases. Uh, when you carry out a pro bono case, uh, does it make the judge sway towards your direction, knowing that, okay, this lawyer is doing this on pro bono, and, and so what other resources he's putting in or he's putting in uh, needs to be supported? Uh, does the judge look at that? I don't think the judges are aware that the case is being done pro bono. No, okay. yes, they're so not aware. No, the judges are not, are not aware that the case is being done pro bono. Mm -hmm. I think that is more a situation for you and the client to discuss okay. on the side. Because if the judges are aware that cases are done pro bono, that means they're aware of what um, clients that pay, pay for. And they're not. So okay. it's not something that they're aware of. It's just they handle the matter like every other matter. Right, uh, let's uh, talk about, uh, you said, uh, I want to know how to the court determine which judge handles which case and all that because you made mention of uh, before you made SAN they look at the number of cases you've done and uh, so how does the court arrive at okay yes this uh, particular judge or lawyer is well equipped to handle this case or not how do they go about that how, how, who decides you mean who decides who handles the matter, yeah. as in the lawyer or the court? Yeah, the court. Is it the court? No, in terms um, of judges, the cases, uh, uh, where, who decides where a case goes to? Okay, what so, court so, is it? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, the cases are being handled in the courts. They are being shared amongst the courts. I think that's something that is done in the courts, not okay. out of the courts. So me now, as a lawyer, I wouldn't know 
why my case got to this court. All I know is that, okay, I have filed my processes and I'm, I've been my matter has been assigned to this court. So I think when it comes to having a particular matter go to a particular judge, it's something okay. that is done within the court system. You know, I think it's under the directive of the CJN of that court. So it's more of under the chief judge of the court that assigns the uh, matters to each individual court. All right, uh, let's just wrap up uh, as soon as we're just two minutes away from the break time. Uh, in terms of FIDA, what has been the challenges FIDA has faced the most uh, carrying out uh, very uh, strenuous cases? Um, I think just like every other organization, what we are, we're hoping to people that we're open to people that can help us in terms of finances, in terms of outreaches, you know, in terms of also we're also welcoming lawyers. Okay. So as well, we are the Federation of Women Lawyers, so we're looking at lawyers that can also help going out to these communities, having those pro bono cases, um, encouraging people about their rights, you know, making them aware of their rights and seeing how they can enforce those rights in court and, you know, possibly get that legal redress that they seek or that they want. I thought I was going to hear uh, uh, FIDA say something uh, during the NSAS protest issue, especially when they had to do with one of the DJs who was uh, a female. Uh, is there a f uh, say something about the issue, sorry, what issue? Yeah, it was uh, to speak on part of the female uh, artist who, who was allegedly pointed to have uh, given fake news. And she was very strong about the fact that uh, she, that was mm -hmm. what she saw, the, the shooting at Lucky Togit was real. I, I, I thought FIDA was going to come into that matter. Um, I don't know if FIDA is going to involve themselves personally with that DJ and yeah, circumstances yeah. because what of, what of, one of the things that we saw from those situations that most of the stuff that was being carried out in the media were not genuine, they were okay. being falsified. There was a lot of, um, you know, falsifying of images from the media and what was happening on ground was not what was reflected on social media, you know. So I think that was part of the problems that we had with the NSAS campaign. Okay. But yes, FIDA was on ground in Sorry. the campaign, lending out their voices, you know, pushing for the rights that we feel that our citizens should be enforced by the government. All right, uh, thank you. All right, uh, we'll be going for a very quick break. In case you're just joining us, you're watching Dialogue on Liberty Television. My guest is Prada Uzodima, helping us to look at uh, uh, the challenges facing the uh, judiciary and uh, the consequences is what we're looking at. We'll go for a very quick break. When we return, the program Dialogue continues. Stay with us. You're watching Dialogue on Liberty Television. My name is Anthony Momodu, and on today's edition of the program, we are looking at uh, Nigeria's judicial challenges and the consequences. And my guest on today's edition is one of Nigeria's finest uh, lawyers in the person of Prada Uzodima, helping us look at uh, the challenges facing uh, the Nigerian judicial sector. But uh, let's look at one of the big issues uh, most times Nigerians are wary of the uh, lawyers and the judiciary is the fact that cases seem never ending <laughs> and also you, you, you've got the ability to uh, postpone put forward cases 
endlessly with your technical issues. Uh, can you tell us, uh, is that what uh, uh, you, lawyers have been schooled? Uh, the ability to you know, push forward cases with different excuses, so to say? Um, uh, no, and I think that um, when a lawyer, um, you know, forcefully delays a matter or delays a case, I think that yeah. goes against the oath that we have taken as lawyers, you know, to act in the best interest of our, you know, of our clients. Um, and if, what is the cause of this delay, right? Okay. It's just a bunch of lawyers, you know, trying to probably build their clients extra because the longer the case goes, the build more, them extra. you know, so I think that is wrong, you know, okay. from a legal perspective, that is wrong. And I think lawyers that do that should actually face some form of consequence. But I think lawyers, um, Delaying or possibly delaying is not the only thing that causes delay in okay. courts or delay with trials. We also have the issues of when maybe judges die, you know, or they retire or they're being elevated to a higher court. Right. So the principle of law that it means that once a judge perhaps dies or, is, or retires, it means that the matter starts de novo. So what that means is that the Start matter starts over. afresh. Okay. So you have a matter that is very close, you know, towards the end and then maybe the judge is elevated or perhaps the judge passes. That matter that goes on to, when it moves on to the next judge has to start as fresh. But why is that? Are they not records of uh, uh, inventory of, uh, uh, you know, facts and figures taken already? I think that is because there's a very slim line between that and miscarriage of justice. Now, you want to feel like the judge that is hearing your matter has heard your matter from the start. Okay. You know, you want to feel like they have all the information, they were able to see, you know, because part of giving a judgment is be able to look at the person concerned, looking at their emotions, their body language. I think that is what one of the reasons that um, informed that um, decision. But I think it's something that we as a judiciary needs to reconsider okay. because it causes a lot of delays in trials and in procedures. I mean, we have people that are even discouraged from pursuing um, legal um, redress and court because they feel like the matter will take years, which is the reality of the situation. So I think those issues need to be looked at, how lawyers handle the matters and how um, judges can actually take up a case and not have it to start de novo. Maybe I think the court or the judge should be allowed to have discretion to decide if they want to start the matter from okay. scratch or if they want to continue feeling like what they've read is enough evidence to move forward with the matter. So I think looking at that, that would be a solution to the delay in trials. All right. I, uh, with this issue you spoke about, can we look at uh, the computerization of uh, the law courts uh, as another factor which uh, could help the the why is it that uh, you, the CJN the hasn't looked towards that direction while we're still doing manual things when it has to do with uh, the sector um when you look at something you must also look at the disadvantages of that thing right so having a judge being able to adjudicate over a matter okay. requires not just the knowledge of the laws i think it requires to some extent some form of emotion some form of you know I knowing we're supposed to kill their emotions when they are no what i mean as in it requires being able to see through because judges are given discretion okay. right and if things were black and white judges wouldn't be given discretion right so we want to make things very practical you know there are situations where for example now um a party cannot make it to the court because they've lost a loved one or something has happened. So that is where the discretion of the court comes in, right? So asking, for example, a robot, you know, to give the, that judgment, it seems like it takes away the humanity from the case. And we are humans. We cannot operate like robots, which we are not. Okay. And I think I've also come across a research that I've read in the past that talks about the involvement of, you know, this um, um, 21st century movement in terms of where computers are being made to give judgments. And okay. that. I think that is fine and good when the judgment has been written by an actual judge. You know, when we have like things like filing of processes in court, they can be digitalized, but the actual adjudication of the law, I feel like it needs to be left down to the humans. But uh, you made mention, uh, I want to dwell on the emotional part of uh, the whole case. Uh, how sincere is it when people say, or lawyers believe the judges and themselves uh, are straightforward, they don't put emotions when uh, they are getting down to work? Is it possible? Is it realistic? I don't think there's, I think judges are humans, right? Yeah. So I wouldn't say that there's a case that came to court that was very sad, maybe someone lost a loved one, and the judge okay. would say that, okay, I am not saddened by this fact. I think that is impossible, right? Okay. But what we must not do is allow those emotions affect the judgment. So how can we tell? That's, that's actually where my question is going to hit. And that is something that we cannot do. Right? We cannot tell what influenced the judge to give yeah. that particular judgment. And we cannot also even look into 
what factors the judges considered, right? The only options we have are what we call a judicial review. Okay. And judicial review does not look at why that decision was made, but it looks at is the decision right or wrong? Mm, okay. Does something else influence the decision? So it doesn't look as, as to why did the judge make that decision, but more of what was wrong with this decision that was made. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So that is what we have um, as a redress, judicial review, when we appeal um, matters of when we go for like judicial review, is what surrounded the circumstances of that decision being made, not to why was and that decision being made. Is it possible made. if after the review, if it's found that there's something amiss, is it possible for the ruling to be upturned? Yes, once, um, the outcome of a judicial review, once the, the something that was brought up and the, the ruling was maybe there was something wrong with the ruling, of course it will be. They will be given a, consequ a consequential judgment, so an added judgment to follow up from that. Okay, uh, there's this question about this uh, person who is alleged to be uh, a kidnapped kingpin. Uh, the way the case is going, it seems like uh, he's gradually slipping away from the grasp of uh, the, 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 uh, the arm of the law. Uh, what could be, what should Nigerians expect? Well, I'm looking at uh, Evans now. Okay, so yeah. his matter is still in court. Yeah, it's still in court, but uh, the, 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 the time is taking because with all the evidences that the police have shown Nigerians and everything, we expected this should have been done and dusted. What do you think is playing out right now? Um, well, I'm not familiar with the facts. Of the, I'm not yeah. handling the matter, so I'm not no, so sure I'm what's going sense. on in court. Um, but I think it's just the general disadvantage of, you know, like what, what I spoke about, the delay in trials, you know, maybe it's a postpone, postponement by the and the matter had to start the novel so I don't know what particularly is causing the delay in that um, case but what we have is I think a growing judicial system that is not perfect it requires some work can be worked on but I think Nigerians have to just give a hope you know all right, uh, let's look at not just the ugly side of the judiciary let's look at the bright side uh, how do you how well is Nigeria doing with uh, the judicial system and how worse would things would have been uh, without the judiciary looking at the challenges the judiciary face aside uh, financing? Well, I know the judiciary is a very essential part of every government, a functioning country. I mean, if, if I was a citizen and I felt like if I was wrong, I couldn't approach anybody for some form of resolution or solution, then I think that takes away from my human rights. So the judiciary is very important. I know that our judiciary has challenges, and I feel like that is something that we are working towards. What we have in Nigeria is what I'd like to refer to as a growing judiciary system. So although we're not perfect, although we have people that we feel like have superseded us in terms of how they deal with the judiciary in different countries, but we like to must apply our judiciary to our given circumstances. And I feel like what we have is a growing judiciary system. We're not perfect, but we're growing, right? Now, what areas do you think uh, needs to be worked on, honestly, and uh, uh, so that we could we turn out better uh, lawyers and a better judicial system? So I think there's much, pretty much what we've been discussing all day here today. So the delay in the trials, the impact of corruption, the lack of financial independence, not allowing the judiciary to actually be independent as mandated by the constitution, you know, the executive impact on the judiciary. I think if we can work on those four or five points, I think we will see some level of growth with the judiciary. You know, if we can eliminate the time it takes in getting a matter resolved or the corruption or the impact of the executive on those cases right. and having our independence, I feel like... All right, uh, talking about the impact of the, uh, the uh, executive, uh, mid with before studios, we talked about high-handedness of the executive. Yeah. Uh, how disturbing is that and how has it affected the judiciary? I think just like we mentioned earlier, I think mm. when you brought up the case of the, the Suki, I think that the is what Suki. we're talking okay. about, the high handedness yeah, of, yeah. of the executive. Okay. That is the executive having some indirect say as to, you know, how court orders are being carried out or if they're being carried out at all, you know, and um, that is something that is affecting the judiciary strongly and that is why we are pushing for this financial autonomy and pushing for this independence because I think once we have this independence and like I also should suggest that perhaps considering some form of um, um, enforcement security okay, agencies okay, from the okay. court that can actually assist in having this court orders being ad adhered to, I feel like it's a play a huge role in, you know, advancing our judiciary. 
Okay, uh, you know, we mentioned uh, judiciary as part of the three tiers of government. Uh, it looks like the other two are, are in good rapport, talking about the executive and uh, the legislature. Why is it that the judiciary is technically left uh, behind? Is it that the judiciary doesn't play good politics, even though it's being labeled a corrupt agency or sector? But the judiciary should not be playing politics. They should be an independent body, you know, and, and that is something that we're pushing for, to be completely independent, right? And in order for us to do this, we must be, you know, cut off from the executive finance in the judiciary. Um, with regards to the legislature and the executive, I don't think there's some form of, you know, cooperation. It's, those bodies are supposed to stand independent of one another. Of one another. But are, are they truly standing independent? I, mean, I think it, it is a subjective question, right? How you know, independence is each arm of the government, you know, but what I feel like, from my own perspective as a lawyer, what I feel like the judiciary actually needs that independence because we f play a fundamental role towards also applying and interpreting interpre interpre the law for the legislature and the executive. So I feel like we need that independence. All right, uh, let's just go down a little bit. Uh, let's just educate our viewer a little bit. Uh, let's go to the magistrate court and other court of appeals. Uh, specifically, what are supposed to be the roles of this other court? the magistrate court, the customary court, and the appeal court. So, uh, at times it gets modeled up. Uh, oh, no. Just to indicate Nigerians, okay, so, so to get it clear. Yeah, so each, that each, when there are family issues, we know which direction to face and all yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, so um, each court, uh, being, they mandate their powers from the constitution. And the constitution okay, each court gets yes. its powers from it. Okay. The constitution clearly lists out what and what um, courts can handle. Okay. We see in the Supreme Court, for example, the Supreme Court is um, giving the mandate to be able to handle cases of, for example, state versus state cases, okay. cases that involve the presidency versus another state. So I think each court has its mandate and has its levels. The magistrate courts are like, we have the magistrate courts, we have the area courts that okay. handle perhaps petty crimes. I think in um, Abuja we have the magistrate courts also limited to handle crimes that are less than 5 million or 5 million capped. Okay. Then we proceed from, so any matter that you feel like is any matter that involves something that is more than 5 million, we proceed to the Federal High Court or to the yeah. High Courts of the state. So the Constitution lists out each court and what is expected to happen under each court. Okay, uh, yeah. for court in, in the state, uh, uh, would you say they, they are also suffering the same kind of challenges those at uh, the national level are, uh, are facing? Um, I know the federal courts have some level of independence and autonomy. I think it is the state uh -huh. courts. Yeah, I think it is okay. the state courts that are actually suffering from this um, executive high-handedness, right? So because they are being, their finances are approved by their governors, and I think that okay. was something that the strike was trying to address by encouraging the governors' forum to look into passing laws that allow financial autonomy of each state court. Okay, uh, uh, finally, let's uh, looking at uh, those uh, during this crisis time where uh, there was a strike action. Uh, how uh, there were lots of things that went amiss and wrong. Yeah. Uh, can you give us a picture of what uh, those on the other side of the divide went through and uh, why it lasted as long as it did and why it was also called off uh, without necessary? Would you say the aim was achieved? Um, I think what it is, is a work in progress. Okay. So there hasn't been any final, okay, yes, this is what we're going to do. I think there's still conversations being had behind the scenes. We're still trying to come to some form of compromise, you know, with the governor's um, forum and each state. Um, so I think what we had during the strike was a seizure of the judiciary, but it wasn't a complete seizure because some cases were still being handled online. We had the online courts then open okay. up, yes. And we also had um, some matters. Um, I think to some level, yes. And from and the cases that I took in okay. personally, I felt like I was able to um, still proceed as I would have proceeded normally in the courts. We had done um, good internet, we had the judges coming up, okay. giving their rulings, giving their judgments. I guess so, uh, I think, younger judges. No, we had different judges at different places. We had cases being done via Supreme Courts to okay. so the Federal High Courts, so to the High Courts of the States. We had them online as well. So, although we had the, um, we have were impacted physically by going to the actual courts. Most of our matters okay. were now shifted online, so we were able to like handle those matters and you know educate them online. But right, uh, finally, uh, in terms of uh, the new generation, we know we talked about we're going to look at uh, the, uh, the new generation lawyers. Yeah. Uh, is this something uh, that Nigerians uh, should expect that going forward, uh, the new set of lawyers um, uh, coming out from schools, uh, from call to bar, uh, what's going to be the difference? Is there any difference we're going to see from the old guards? 
who have been there and done that? I think law is, I think, ever-growing, ever-changing. Uh, and is there any pressure on you guys to deliver the goods? Um, I don't think so. I don't feel any pressure in particular because I feel like even our senior advocates, that it took them quite some time to learn, you know, okay. to experience the judiciary. So I feel like that is what will happen to the new recruits, the new wigs that are being called to the bar. They would come out, they would experience the judiciary for themselves. They will have their bad sides, they will have their good sides, but I still consider it a learning experience for each and every new wig, you know. And hopefully um, by the time they get to where we're going, there will have been some major amendments to the judiciary and how it functions. All right, so what, what about the law schools? Uh, some people have told that uh, the, the, the essence of the law school uh, might not be as important or useful as it used to be in the past. Do you agree? And uh, are there better ways we, we can better, you know, uh, you know, churn out greater lawyers or those that call to bar? Um, I'm a product of the law school, so I'm not going to, you know, sit here and, you know, completely <laughs> criticize the law school. I think it's no, the necessary I, I, I part. I areas, great areas that can uh, get better. Let's not forget that the law school is a one-year program. You know, right. a few months for those that did not study abroad. So there's mm -hmm. only so much that can actually be thought within those months or within that year. So, so is it that important? important? I think it's very important if, if because it teaches you how to behave in terms of ethics, Okay. The, it breaks it down to the different types of laws, how to approach the courts, how to address what is expected of you as a lawyer. So I don't think that is something that needs to be scrapped. I think law school is ex extremely very important. But the moment you come out from the law school, you see that law is much more wider than you were taught in the law school. But I think the law school opens up your mind for that, for those experiences outside of the law school. So I think it's a very, very essential part. You know, I think each and every lawyer needs to experience the law school. And the cost implication, uh, most people caught up, uh, often cry aloud that, okay, going to the law school itself coming out is quite expensive so technically some Nigerians who are not really as uh, you know from the poor homes uh, technically find it hard and at times you know yeah. let, loses out on that uh, what can be done shouldn't something be done to give a chance to those who put brilliant minds but do not have the financial power yeah I think that is something that I have looked up in, I uh, looked into, that is why, what made me start my scholarship, it's called the Prada Zoduma Law School Scholarship Grant. So what we look at is the financed indigenous students, aspiring indigenous. lawyers, yes, that so cannot you're, afford you're, you're to pay the fee. specifying a specific area? No, indigenous means those that cannot afford, in, they're okay. not financially capable. Capable, okay. Yes, indigent, okay. sorry, indigent, okay. yes, sorry. Okay. Okay. So that's what we look at, we look at indigent law school students that cannot afford to pay the fees but still want to be called to the bar and then we offer them opportunities. We pay for their tuition fees and we cater for their welfare as well while in the law school and give them a chance to be called to the bar. So how do you determine who, who, who merits it? Oh, we have an application portal so all you need okay. to do is just go onto the website to apply once okay. the application okay. portal is open and you'll be selected if you're lucky. Yeah, we have a panel of judges that actually pick the candidates that they feel that are most deserving of the scholarship grant. All right, uh, like they say, uh, bailiff is free. Uh, the lawyer is your friend. How true is this? Bailiff is free. Bail is free. When you go to the police station, they tell you bail is free. Yeah. And they tell you the lawyer is your friend. But these two things, um, it's hard to believe because every time you go to the police station, you can't live without paying something. Mm. And every time you get the services of a lawyer, aside this one, you can't live without paying some dime. And like you rightly pointed out, some judges or lawyers uh, push forward their cases in order to build the, uh, the clients more. So tell us why we cannot get those two things the way they are supposed to be. Um, to the best of my ability, bail is free. Right, and well, I think have you ever gone to the even in the police stations, they yeah. will tell you that bail is it's free. free yeah. But I think what happens is that um, people give tips to the police officers to probably under duress. To, no, I don't think it's a decision of under duress. I'm, I can't speak for every situation or every okay. circumstance, but I think it's just a, as a way of you know making that bail faster or you know encouraging the police officers to act faster. Okay. And in terms of the legal fees, I feel like we're well, lawyers. We need to be paid for our services. You know, so that is what it is. All right, uh, that's how much uh, we can take on today's edition of the program uh, dialogue. I want to say a big thank you to Prada Uzodima. She's been super amazing. Uh, every time I try to even catch her on the corner, she slips away. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for joining us thank in this you for and me. Thank you for educating us more as regards the challenges uh, the judicial system is facing. And we hope you guys are going to come out better. Thank you. All right, uh, that's how we call it a wrap on the Just Finest uh, Talk Show Dialogue on Liberty Television. My name is Anthony Momodu saying thank you for being part of the deal.
I did enjoy Nollywood film, Orisu, PBO, AMC, be my best channel. But ST Nollywood Plus, they show the latest Nollywood blockbuster on top classic bouquet. How I want to take watch them? By beginning, they enjoy five children's channels. But what called our dream works on top of